Okay, welcome. Come on in, guys. Have a seat. Welcome this morning. It's Father's Day, so uh, we're going to have a Father's Day message here. We've got a nice little uh, plaque in the back here. Looks beautiful. So thank you for being here today. Now, I'm not the kind of guy to always follow a theme. You would think with it being Father's Day, I should be teaching Father's Day stuff. Well, I'm going to be teaching kid stuff. <laughs> Isn't that weird? But I guess you have to be a father to have a kid, so I guess somehow that all ties together. And what I want to do today is just kind of talk about winning kids to the Lord. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And I was a kid that grew up in church my whole life. And I didn't get saved till I was 18. Because I, I was getting some bad information. Some churches, they just don't seem to teach it right. Others do. We've gone through, we've been studying this series of soul winning and winning souls to the Lord the last several weeks. We started with the seven types of sinners. We looked at wisdom in soul winning. We looked at verses uh, to use to win souls to the Lord. And then we looked at uh, surety of salvation, how when we're saved, we have assurance of salvation. We're supposed to know. I believe in a no-so salvation. Amen. But I've been getting this question a lot, um, emails and letters. And even here, some of the folks here have asked, Brother Breaker, how do we win our children to the Lord? And I say, well, that's a great question. That's a great question. We want our kids to be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. So how do we deal with them? How do we show them? I don't think it's any different than with adults. Right. Same gospel. Yeah. I mean, you don't teach a different gospel to kids. You teach the same gospel. So basically, it's the same way that we do with adults. And children are smarter than you think. Yeah. And they pick things up really fast. Yes, um, and sometimes they pick up things they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So you be careful as a parent what you say. Right. Um, Conrad learned a new word the other day. <laughs> flabbergasted. <laughs> he likes funny words. And so he's been using that. Oh, I'm flabbergasted. And then he laughs. You know, he thinks that's so funny. So kids pick up more than you think. And so they should be picking up what they're hearing from church. Right. But they also should be learning in the house from their parents. And they need to know the gospel. We have a tendency to want to try to dumb it down for them, don't we? But when it comes to the gospel, let's don't dumb down the gospel. Right. It's the same gospel that needs to be said. So we're going to start today. I don't have a lot of verses because there are not a lot of verses in the Bible about this. So I'm hoping that you'll have some questions at the end of this. So please, if you do have a question, I'm going to try to do this short. I say that and I usually teach an hour all the time, but I'm going to try to go short. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14. We're going to go to Luke 18, 16 to 17. And we're going to talk about this subject of child evangelism. Matthew 19, 14, the Bible says this. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, Let children come unto me. You know the Lord loves children? I love children. I think they're great. I, I wasn't there in the time of Jesus, but I could only imagine how they would have loved Jesus. Because he's God manifest in the flesh, and he's no sin whatsoever. And children, man, they, they, they would have seen him and said, man, there's something different about him. And I'm sure they flocked to him. I'm sure they sat on his knee, you know, and, and he probably, you know, petted their head and told them he loved them, probably kissed them. I'm sure Jesus was like a child magnet. Children loved him. When I was in Honduras, I felt that way. The kids loved me for some reason. I don't know why, but it was fun. And that's one of the ways we helped start a church. You get the kids. And I went around, knocked on the door and said, I'm doing a kids ministry for the kids. I'm a preacher. If you'd have them come every week. Well, the kids would come, and then the mother would start coming, and then eventually the father. And that's how we were able to start a ministry there in Honduras. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 18. So children are, are wonderful. If you can win the kids, hopefully the kids can win the parents. But the parents should be able to win the kids if the parents are Christians. Luke chapter 18, and verse 16 and 17. Luke 18, 16, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now, he adds something that we don't read in Matthew in the next verse, verse 17. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So the Bible says you've got to receive Jesus as though you were a child. When I read that, I thought, that's pretty good. Because children will believe just about anything they hear. You know how easy it is to tell a kid something and they'll believe it? Now, I'm, I'm guilty of that. When Conrad was a little kid, I'd play tricks on him and I'd say silly things, you know. And uh, I, would, I would do this. I'd go, and I'd say, you hear those dogs outside? And he was probably two years old. And he'd hold me real tight. Daddy, don't let the dogs get me. And I'd go, 
and he really thought there were dogs outside. No, that was me. And I had to tell him that later. I was joking, but I loved the way that he hugged me. So I was like, I'm getting some more hugs out of this. Children will believe anything, won't they? And so salvation is by what? Believing. So when would be the best time to share the gospel? When they're young and, and believe whatever you say. Now, I don't want to use the word gullible, but maybe they are a little bit gullible. That's why you got to be careful. And that's why the world wants your children at a very early age, because they want to indoctrinate them in what they want them to believe. So you got to be careful. But there's no time like the present to share the gospel with your kids. Sometimes we have this mentality of, no, when they get older, then we'll tell them the gospel. No, start now. And at the end of this, I want to go through and show you some things that I believe we need to do as Christians in order to plant the seed. So you must receive the kingdom of God as a child. Well, how do we receive the gospel? How do we get saved? It's by faith. Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Acts 16, verse 30. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30, there's a guy and he asked a question. Acts 16, 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, notice that comma. New versions leave out the comma. It makes you think that when a guy gets saved, his, automatically his whole family is saved. No, that's not how it works. You need to believe and be saved, and then your house needs to believe and be saved. I believe that's what it's saying. So, salvation is by belief. Is that right? You believe and you receive. I've done a video entitled, Believing is Receiving. It's that simple. It's that simple. Salvation is so simple. We looked at, I believe last week, the simplicity of salvation and how simple salvation is. So it's through believing and children, well, they almost believe everything you tell them. So why don't you tell them the gospel? I think that's very important. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know that verse, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So to believe is to exercise faith. Faith is believing. Would you agree with that? Now turn over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, notice what it says here. And that from a child, are you with me? And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So how is salvation? Through what? Faith. I still don't understand how there's people out there that claim to be Christians that say, no, it's not believe that saves you. you got to do this. I just, I don't get that. Do you read the Bible? It's believing. It's faith. It's by trusting. Go to Romans chapter 15, verse 12. Faith is trust. If you have kids, your children trust you, don't they? Whether you're a good parent or a bad parent, your children trust you. So if they trust us, then they should trust us enough to tell them the truth. And we should tell them the truth of the gospel. Romans chapter 15, verse 12, the Bible tells us that it's all about trust. So in Romans 15, if I can get over there, Romans chapter 15, verse 12, the Bible says this. Romans 15, 12. And again, Esaias, which is Isaiah, saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So the Jews rejected the Messiah. Now today we get saved and we're saved by faith. We're saved by believing. It's trust. Ephesians 1.13. Look at Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. What does that say? Ephesians 1.13 says, actually let's start in verse 12. Ephesians 1.12 and 13. That we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. So trust and believe is used interchangeably. So salvation is through faith. Faith in what? Believe, faith, trust. Trust in what? Well, we've looked at that. We've looked at it's the gospel. Well, it says right there, it's the gospel. What's the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And let's go over there. We believe that. We preach that to adults. So why wouldn't we preach that to children? Right. I think the sooner you do that, the better. Now, I've told you all before my testimony, how I was raised in church just about every Sunday. I was in church from, from the age of a child, and I wasn't even saved until I was 18 years old. Because in those churches, unfortunately, we never heard the gospel. 
A lot of churches nowadays don't preach the gospel. I've been to over 200 churches preaching, and I like to ask, where's the gospel in the Bible? And only about 11 times has someone raised their hand and said 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The rest of the times, a lot of church goes, well, we don't know. Well, how do you preach that if you don't know what that is? <laughs> so let's go there and read the passage that said this is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. So this is the gospel that saves. To keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now, I don't get into that, but you know what that means? To believe in vain means you're not really believing it. You believe from the heart. We've seen that. Someone maybe just believes it in their head. That's not good enough. You've got to trust with all of your heart. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And I love this word, how. It's not just that Christ died for our sins. It says how that Christ died for our sins. How did he die? He shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now flip over to Romans chapter 3. The Bible says we're saved by faith, by believing. Believing in what? Well, Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 has the answer. This is how I got saved. I told you my testimony. It was through this verse. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation. That means the act of appeasing wrath. God's wrath was appeased when Jesus died on the cross. He took our hell for us. You can pay for your sins in hell, or you can choose Jesus that already paid for them. It's up to you. you can pay for them yourself, or trust him who paid for them. I'll take him, please whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So well, there's the faith in the what? Faith in the blood. To declare his righteousness for the mission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So when it comes to a child, a child needs to hear that. But why do so many people think, no, they don't need to know that. Let's dumb it down. Let's just, let's just tell them something different. Well, a lot of churches nowadays, they do that. They don't go to the gospel and, and point them to the blood. They say things like this to children. These are the things that I heard in many Southern Baptist churches when I was a kid. I didn't hear the gospel message and come to Jesus and the substitute and the blood, the substitutionary blood atonement. I never heard that. All I heard was, well, just ask God to forgive you. Just ask Jesus in your heart. Just repeat this prayer after me. Uh, just give your life to Christ or give your life to Jesus. Do you realize none of those are in the Bible? Do you realize that you can do these without? You can do this without faith. Now, I'm not saying everybody that does doesn't believe at the same time. They, they can believe at the same time. But this is what happened to me. As a child, that's all I heard. And I did that over and over and over, but I hadn't trusted in what Jesus did yet because no one explained it to me. So they started using man-made terms and they dumbed down, if you will, the gospel <laughs> for a kid, thinking a kid's too dumb to understand it. Well, I would understand it if someone would have preached it to me right. Mm -hmm. I told you about when I was a kid and there was a guy named Jason in my class. And I must have been, I was in, not middle school, so I must have been maybe eight, nine, or ten years old. And I was the runt of the class and Jason was the giant of the class because I think he had two years failed. <laughs> so he was kept back two years. So he was taller than everybody and I'm shorter than everybody. And one time in class, I did something. To this day, I don't remember what I did, but I did something. And in those days, they could still spank you. And the teacher said, who did this thing? And I was too scared. And she lined us up in the class in front and said, whoever did that, step forward and get your licks. That's what they called it, a lick. And Jason was standing next to me, and I was like this, and I knew I did it, and I knew I deserved it. And I was about to step forward and receive my licks, and he went like this, and he stepped forward, and he goes, I did it. And I kept looking at him and he took my spankings for me. The whole rest of the year, if Jason needed something, he got it. Jason, you got your pencil today? I got an extra pencil, do you need it? Oh, you don't have paper, I'll get I mean, I love that guy for what he did for me. He took my payment, or, or my penalty, he paid for what I did. Yeah. That's what salvation is, it's the substitutionary blood atonement of Christ. It's very easy to teach children, but we dumb it down, don't we? And sometimes we say it a little differently for them. Well, what happened to me? From hearing this my whole life as a kid, I thought that the prayer is what saved me. That's, that's all I knew. So every night I'd get down by my bed and say, please save me, Jesus. I pray the prayer over. I was trusting in the prayer I said rather than the blood God shed. Right. I wish someone would have explained it better. When I was five years old, I started crying one morning at uh, breakfast. And my mom comes to me and she says, why are you crying? And I said, because I'm going to die someday. 
And all I could think about was I'm just going to cease to exist. I'm just going to die. And it just, it's will be black and I won't exist anymore. And she said, well, you just need to ask Jesus in your heart. You know, I didn't know who Jesus was. I thought he was the guy that sat in the back pew because they talked about him a lot in church. I heard his name. So I did that. But I wasn't safe because I wasn't trusting in what Jesus did for me. And every night I'd get down by my bed and I'd do it over and say, oh, please save me this time because I guess it didn't last time. So do you see how I was confused as a child? Let's don't confuse children. Let's give them the same gospel that we believe in and pray that they'll believe in it as well. So you've got to receive the atonement. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Let's preach the blood to the kids. You know, some ladies, they, they're squeamish. Ooh, I don't like talking about blood. Well, salvation is through the blood. Well, I don't want the kids to need... Kids need to know salvation is through the blood. Okay? So let's don't hold back. All right? But look at verse 11 is the one I wanted. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So you must receive the atonement. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 18. And while you're turning over there, let me tell you what I've seen in many churches over the years and in my lifetime and my ministry. They just go to kids and they just tell them, now repeat after me. And they say, now you're saved because you did that. Now is salvation by what we did? It's not something we did. It's by trusting what Jesus did. And a lot of kids will make a profession at an early age. They will profess with their mouth and say, well, I'm saved because I did that. I did what they told me to do. But you know, profession is not possession. Are they saved or are they just saying they're saved? I grew up with some friends of mine who knew how to manipulate their parents. And so their parents were like, you need to get saved, you need to, and they do that just because their parents want to. And then when their parents went away, they go, stupid idiots, who they, I don't believe that junk. They made a profession with their mouth, but they had no possession because they weren't saved. They knew how to make themselves look like they were Christians, but they weren't. And later on in life, a lot of those guys ended up in sin. Some of the biggest fornicators I've ever known in my life. They were evil and wicked. One of them's dead and in hell right now. But when he was a kid, he made a profession. He told everybody he was saved because he said the prayer. That's what he said. So why is it all of our kids, a lot of kids, are claiming to be Christians as children and then they grow up and they deny Christ. Does that mean they lost their salvation? Do you, do you believe in eternal security? I do. I don't believe you can lose it. So what I think is they, they never had it to begin with. Because someone didn't take the time to give them the true gospel and they got them to make a profession, but they didn't care enough to see if they understood and really had possession of salvation. Are you with me? So I think it is very, very important that we take time with children and give them the gospel. Yes, Don't dumb it down for them. We just give them the same way we give adults. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 6. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. <laughs> so you want to be saved, you've got to come as a child. Children are humble, usually. And so you've got to come and just childlike faith believe. But yet we've dumbed it down for a lot of people. And I just, I find that sad. Uh, I was going to tell this story later, but I got to move. I want to, want to finish up a little early today. When I was on deputation as a missionary to Honduras, I did what's called missions conferences. And I was with other missionaries. And uh, oftentimes I'd ask them their testimony. And it was, well, when I was a kid, I, I said the little prayer. I heard one told me, he said when he was three years old, he got saved. And I kind of went, I don't know about that. And I'd ask him, so, but when did you trust in the blood atonement of Christ? When did you trust the gospel? Where's the gospel? I don't know. I'm like, you're wanting to be a missionary? You don't even know what the gospel? Well, let me show you. And I'd take it through them, and I'd show them, and they go, I've never heard that before. And yet you're going to mission field to try to win people to the Lord, and you're not. They weren't preaching what I'm preaching, the gospel of salvation through faith in the blood of Christ. So I've run into a lot of this, and I, it bothers me. I was in, I believe it was Connecticut, or Rhode Island, one of those two. And I was in a church with a missionary, no, an evangelist. 
that our old church said was the greatest evangelist that ever came out of that old church. He gets up there and he did chalk talks too. He, he actually would, would do chalk talks. But anyway, this guy, he, he did this and then he goes, now if anybody here is not saved, raise your hand. And uh, a little kid was five years old and these other kids go, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. And they made this little five-year-old kid raise his hand. And that evangelist told me, you take him outside and win him to the Lord. I said, okay. And when I did, the other kids came too. So I took him outside and I said, what's your name? And he was like, my name is Freeman. And he's, looking, he's not even paying any attention to me. I said, how old are you? I'm, I'm five years old. And he's not even. I said, well, first of all, are you a sinner? Do you know what sin is? He had no idea what I was talking about. He was picking up rocks and throwing. He wasn't even listening. So I'm trying to tell this five-year-old child how to be saved. I said, well, if you don't know what sin is, how do you get saved? So I took him back in. I told him, I said, brother, he's too young. He doesn't understand yet. Right. You know what that man said? I do not, I, I'm not going to tell you his name, but I think he's the worst evangelist in the world, is what I think. Because he said, nonsense. Anybody can get saved. Come here, boy, repeat after me. I'm a sinner. Please save me. Amen. I'm a sinner. Please save me. He goes, You're saved now. Go sit down. And I just looked at that shocked. Yeah. He didn't even know what sin was. But he's saved now. He repeated something. You know, there's a difference between repeating and repenting. Do you know what repent means? Change of mind. I think that's my old Greek teacher right there. Amen. He taught me that. Metanoia. Am I saying it right? Change of mind. Change of mind. Did that little child have a change of mind? No. No? He just repeated something, but he didn't get taught the gospel. He didn't realize, he didn't even admit he was a sinner. I'm going to be careful when I come to children. Right. I don't want to do that. I'll tell you a story. Someone in my family, I'll just say that. I won't say who. Someone in my family. I asked them, are you a Christian? Are you saved? They said, yeah, I'm saved. Aren't I? And they looked at their mother. Aren't I, mom? Aren't I saved? Like they didn't even know. And they said, yeah, yeah, you, you did this when you were a kid. You said the little prayer. See, she said I'm saved. Is salvation something that we declare on people? They're saved because I say so. Is that? What we've been looking at is we share the gospel with people. We give them the verses. We let God um, deal with their hearts. They have to understand. There's something you've got to understand before you can say. And when you're saved, then you know you're saved. Is that person saved? They're like, I don't know I'm saved. Am I? Well, she said. So they're trusting in what she said instead of what Jesus said. And that's sad. Yep. Now, by your fruit, you shall know them. Is that a saved person? One of the worst fornicators and adulterers I've ever known. So I'm not saying they're saved because they're the works, but I'm saying a lot of people as children do something and then grow up thinking they're a Christian because of something that happened when they were a kid. Mm -hmm. And they may make a profession and they may repeat something, but they've never truly trusted the gospel and they've never repented because there's been no change of mind there. They've not understood, hey, it's what Jesus did. They're still trusting in something they've done. Are you all with me? Amen. Am I the biggest heretic that ever lived for explaining this? I think I'm just pointing out the obvious. Yep. I can just see it tomorrow, though, all over the Internet. There'll be videos on YouTube saying that's heretical teaching breaker. Okay, whatever. But I'm just telling you, I'm pointing out the obvious. Amen. Now, this brings us to what we call the age of accountability. And the age of accountability, what is that? Well, let's uh, go to Jonah chapter 4. There is not a lot in the Bible about this. And this is actually a man-made term that, that men have, have uh, made up. But I think it's, it's a Bible doctrine. And uh, as I said, there's, there's not a lot of verses in the Bible on this. So this is something that we kind of have to, to think by connecting the dots. There is an age that every child comes to in which that's the age when they realize they're a sinner that deserves hell. And they choose wrong and the, because they realize the difference between right and wrong. Now, like I say, there's not a lot of verses in there, but let's go to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? So this would be children that don't know right from the left. So the age of accountability, some churches say that's 13. Some denominations say it's a certain age. Others say, well, it's a, I don't believe it's an age that's uniform that all people once they reach that age I think it's different for all children right. 
Every child develops a little different, some faster than others. So it's different for every child. In Honduras, they grew up fast down there. Do you know there were kids 10, 11 years old having babies? And yet the age of accountability is 13, is it? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I remember going to a village in Honduras and a three-year-old kid with a machete out there working. And he comes in, hey, oh, you want to see my parents follow me? And he's three years old. I'm like, this guy's got a machete. I wouldn't give my four-year-old a machete, would you? I mean, scary. So they grow up faster in countries like that. I see eight-year-olds and they're carrying a little two-year-old baby all around. Where's your parents? Oh, they're at work. Eight-year-old raising a kid. So kids grow up and reach that age at different ages. You can even be an adult and still not have reached that age if you have some sort of a, what do I call it, a learning disability? One of my friends, he had a sister. She was dumb and deaf and blind. She never learned how to read or write. She never learned how to talk. All she learned was how to get out of her bed, walk down the hall, find the bathroom, and go back. She's got to be, well, she was 40 20 years ago, so she's probably 60, 70 years old doesn't even know her own name. I wonder if she's ever even reached the age of accountability. Right. The age of accountability is the age of when you realize right from wrong yep. and you willfully choose to do wrong. Mm -hmm. Now God is going to hold you accountable for your sin. Yes. Before that, why would he? Because you don't know you did wrong. Right. So the age of accountability, different for all kids. And we need to realize that and we need to look at children. We need to question them. We need to ask them. We need to explain to them the gospel, and then ask and see if, if there's any understanding there. Remember what the Bible says? Understand with your heart and be converted, Matthew 13, 15. There's understanding involved in salvation. So do they understand? Mark chapter 10, real quick. And so I don't want to uh, give kids a false presentation of the gospel or dumb it down for them. I just want to explain it to them. Plant the seed and pray that God will open their hearts and so they'll be saved. But they sure need to know what sin is. You can't just take a little child, three years old, and say, now repeat after me now, I declare you saved now. I, that bothers me when I see that. It really bothers me. What bothers me even more is to see that happen three or four times in a row. And uh, I, I've been to a lot of vacation Bible schools. I've been to a lot of churches where they do that. You're Hiles churches, okay? I'm just say it. I've been to Hiles churches, and I've gone on the buses with the bus ministry guy. And he said, every time I went to soul the Lord, I write it in my Bible. I said, let me see your Bible. And I'm looking, there's the same name ten times. <laughs> so which one of those ten times did that guy get? Do you see how confusing that is? That, that's kind of scary. That lack of discernment in that guy? I mean, where's the discernment? You only get saved once, people, right? right. So did they even get saved, or is it? A dumbing down of the gospel. That, that bothers me. I want a plain preaching, a plain presentation of the gospel. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. Mark 10, 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. They're like, no, uh take those away. We don't do children here. <laughs> we don't. I think Jesus knew the right thing to say at the right time to the children. So there's nothing wrong with Vacation Bible School if you do it the right way. Right. But we'd have to be very careful, very careful. Because for many years, I wasn't saved, thinking I was saved, but I didn't know if I was saved, doubting myself. And I was, I was confused until someone thought enough about me to sit me down and explain the gospel to me. And then I got saved. So, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. So, children are a blessing from God. Yep. If you really love your children, give them the gospel the same way you would an adult. Yep. Explain it to them so that they can understand. Now, I'll close with this. While we have them and there are children, as a parent, what should we do? The first thing we should do with the Bible is read, uh, with our kids, is read the Bible with them daily. Plant that seed with those children. My mom, for many years, was a Pentecostal, so she was off on her doctrine. But I love my mom, and my mom would read the Bible to me every night before I went to bed as a child. Those are fond memories that I had as a kid. And that helped me learn the Bible as a kid because she would actually read it. Now, granted, it wasn't the King James Bible. It was a picture Bible. <laughs> so it was like a comic book Bible because I'd look at the pictures and listen to her read. 
but at least she planted the seed of many of those stories in the Bible. So how is a child going to get saved if he doesn't hear the Word of God? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word. word of God. So if we love our kids, we want to see them get saved, we should be reading the Bible. Deuteronomy, real quickly, Deuteronomy 11, 18. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. I know this is Old Testament, but this is God telling them how to do what they do with their children so we can make spiritual application to us today. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Verse 19, and you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Yep. So the parents are supposed to be speaking and giving Bible to their children. Do you do that? Right. Next is pray. Yep. Pray with the child. Do you pray with your kids? They need to know God is real. Yeah. And they need to know the person they're praying to is a, is a real person. Let's go to Psalms 119. The next thing I want to say is the best thing you can do, and, and that's kind of nice that we do it here as well, is teach them to memorize Scripture. Yeah. Memorize Scripture. You plant that seed in them, it can grow. Amen. So Psalms 119 and verse 11 we read, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So the more Bible verses they learn, the more chance God has to deal with them. Um, train them up in the ways of God. Go to Proverbs 22, 6. So train them right. Train them in the ways of God in the Bible. Going to church is a good way to, to help them see, hey, we need to put God first. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Proverbs 22, 6. Look what it says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Right. So it is the mother's and the father's responsibility. Today's Father's Day to do that. And then preach to them the gospel mm -hmm. yep. without dumbing it down. You don't have to use modern terms that modern church people use that aren't even in the Bible. I remember Dr. Rubman used to preach against asking Jesus in your heart. When my dad went to school there, and then when I was there, I heard that a little bit. And I've got a quote from him. There's a lanolized, flannelized gospel in the world today. We're not preaching, ask Jesus, ask which Jesus, which heart, you know, things like that. You know, it's just, it's funny how he, but you hear this everywhere nowadays. Show me the verse where it says any one of these. It's not there. The Bible says Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Amen. So. I want us to love our children and teach to them correctly. Let's uh, go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I want our children to be saved, but we have to have wisdom, and we need to give them the truth and pray and look and try to figure out when is the age of accountability and then just keep giving them the gospel till they believe it. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Okay, that's for the fathers. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, I would love to read the rest of that chapter, but I don't have time. But you can read that later and look at that and see that how important that is. So let's close in 2 Timothy. And then I want to take time for questions. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, I read this earlier, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So as a child we should be teaching them the scriptures. But then look at verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Instruct your children in the ways of God and give them the gospel and pray that they get saved. All right, does anyone have any questions or anything they would like to add to this real quick? Anybody? A lot of people have asked me to do a, a video on this about the age of accountability and things like that. Anybody? Raise your hand if you have a question. Just yes, sir. That age of accountability that you said again. Well, some people think the age of accountability is 13 years old. Others say, no, it's, it's 10. Or It's different for every child because every child develops at a different rate. Yeah. Some become more aware faster, some are more intellectual quicker. So for every child, it's different. But it's the age in which someone realizes right from wrong 
and they willfully choose, I'm going to do wrong. That's when God says, okay, I'm going to hold you accountable for your sin now. So that's what the age of accountability is. It's not an age. It's an understanding, pretty much. Anybody else? Another question? Comment? Anybody? Anybody? Come on, now's the time. Brother Mike, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, oh come on, you've got to be. Will somebody have another verse on this? You know, we've got parents in here. And um, is there like a verse that you use or is there something that you've seen as you saw your children come to the Lord? Anybody have something like that? Raise up a child and the way you should go. Right, and the way. Yep. I gave that verse. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just going to say children need assurance. And my mother told me when I was a child that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Right. And that sunk deep into my heart. Right. Amen. That's good. So tell them, but also tell them that God loves them and wants to be with them. And once you're saved, well, he's never going to leave you. So yes, uh, we need to teach that to children as well. Um, in Germany, I've, I've met some people recently from Germany over there. God is a mean God that just wants to hurt people. That's how they view God. He's this God that shoots lightning bolts every time you sin. Um, yes, God has his side of judgment, but he also has a side of love. So you can't give your children a one-sided view of God. And you need to explain to them who God is and what God's willing to do for them and what he has done for them. And that if they are saved, then he'll be with them forever. Amen. That's good. That's good. Um, don't scare them away from God. Sometimes we do that, don't we? Um, anybody else? I can tell you that my accountability Good date second. was nine years old. When you were nine, you, so for you it was nine. Yes, ma'am. I would like to get baptized. Okay, we can talk about that after, all right? But baptism doesn't save us, okay? It's not what saves us. It's trusting in Jesus that saves you. You can do that after you're saved, but to get saved, it's not baptism. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. But uh, we need to explain that to children, too. I have seen children that were thinking that baptism saves them. I had someone in my family. I said, when did you get saved? Oh, when I was like six years old. And this pastor baptized her and told her, now you're going to heaven. And so for her rest of her life, she thought that that was what saved her, the water baptism. That's somebody that did not preach correctly the gospel of salvation and left somebody... A fake Christian. I mean, what, I don't know what other word to term to use. Someone who thought they were a Christian, but they're lost. That's a lost religious person. Right. Do you know our pews are full of people like that? Yeah. Who think they're saved because they did something and they're trusting in something they did, but they're not trusting in what Jesus did. Yep. They have a profession, but no possession. They repeated something, but they never repented in the sense that they didn't have a change of mind and understand. Oh, so it's not what I do. Oh, it's trusting completely. It's by faith in what he did. So I want people to be saved, amen? Oh, Bob Jones Sr. said in about 1940, he said, of all the churches I preached in, he said, I wonder if 50% of those people were even saved. And he preached in a lot of churches. And that was back then. Imagine what it is today. <laughs> it is sad. And it's because a bunch of panty lace sissy preachers are afraid to preach the true gospel of salvation. And that, that saddens me greatly. Yes, ma'am. Um, if we could do that, like, like, like some people think, then we wouldn't need Jesus and he would have died for nothing. In his right, name. right. You now, see? I, I believe in the gospel. I believe that he died because he loved us and he wanted us to be saved. Right. He wanted us to die and go to hell. Exactly. It's what Jesus did to save us. If we can save ourselves by what we do, then why did Jesus die? Exactly. He didn't have to. We could get to heaven. We didn't need him. No, we need him because he's the only one that can save us. And what does he ask? He says in the book of Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please him. God doesn't want your riches. God doesn't want your intellect. God doesn't, God doesn't want anything but for you to believe in him and trust him. Isn't that what you want from your children? You want them to trust you? So tell them the truth. Share the gospel with them. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. If, um, would you say that if a child is, say, two, three, four, and they do say, yes, I want to be saved, and they pray that most likely they're not? Or is it just looking over the years at their fruit? It depends on what they're trusting in. Yeah. If they just do that because mommy and daddy said to do that, and then mommy and daddy said, now you're saved because you did that, mm -hmm. do you see how that's going to lead to doubt? Because they're trusting in that. But if they understand the gospel and at the same time get saved by believing, then they're saved. 
So They're under the age of accountability, they are safe. Yeah, the better word would be safe. safe. <laughs> They're right. safe because if they were to die under the age of accountability, I don't see God putting them in hell because they've never had a chance to sin yet. Right. So I like to use the word safe in the sense that they're safe from, from going to hell because they had sin. But now, when they do reach the age of accountability, they need to get saved. So it's a good point, but I, I think that's a good distinction. Saved versus safe. Well, they're safe until they get to that point. But it's important that we make sure what they're trusting in and that they understand. And from this whole series of what we've been doing, understanding is key, right? The importance of understanding the gospel, okay? And uh, sometimes it's hard to know what your kids understand because in the case of my child, Conrad, he's in a different world, <laughs> right? You want to talk to him and he's thinking about all this that's happening over there. And it's hard to, so you, there's part of that is maturity too, when they get old enough and more mature and then they're able to understand. Because a lot of kids, they just, their mind is on, I got to go play soldier. I got to go play fireman. I got to play poo poo, pow pow, you know, cowboys and Indians. And so they're thinking about all this other stuff. But there's a time when you sit down and their mind is on you. And a lot of times that's the nighttime, right before bed. And they'll hang on every word if you read them a book. Why don't you read them a book? Amen? Uh, that's when they'll focus, all right? I guess we'll stop early today in, in case someone has something else they'd like to add. I'd love to hear it. This is your time, question, or even a comment. Anybody else? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity today to come and present this. Lord, we pray for our children. Lord, we want to see them get saved. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us uh, to give them the gospel. Lord, you'd help us to love them and to train them up and to give them the verses. And uh, Lord, we just pray, God, that you would work on their hearts and save them. Lord, we want the next generation to be saved. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.